Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UTS Animal Logic Academy webinar on portfolio and application tips. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Alex Waite. I'm the creative lead here at the Academy. And joining me is one of our students from this year, uh, Alison, Alison Valencia. Welcome, Alison. Hello, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Alex. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks so <laughs> much uh, for being here and being a part of it. Uh, we are... We are storytellers here at the Academy and in this industry as well. Uh, it's something that we love to do, which is tell stories. And what I'd like to do as well is acknowledge the original storytellers uh, of this country, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I uh, would also like to pay respects to the elders, both, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land and storytellers as well. So uh, here we are, where well, you can see our faces. Uh, that's us. Alison uh, it's, is joining us because while it's great for us to tell you about everything that we want and how to apply, it's great to have some firsthand experience as well from someone who's been through the process. So uh, Alison is here to answer any of your questions as well. Now, a bit of housekeeping about that. Uh, you can ask questions through the Q&A uh, chat box. There are people there to help you out, and I or Alison are also uh, available to answer those questions as we go. There'll be a bit of time at the end of the webinar to answer any uh, any questions as well. Okay, uh, Animal Logic, the UTS Animal Logic Academy. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about what we do here before we get into kind of like the meat of the talk today. So we are a collaboration between UTS and one of Australia's uh, largest animation studios, Animal Logic, and it's set to set up to address the talent gap uh, in this booming industry that we're going through at the moment to really help juniors enter the industry with the full set of skills and knowledge that they need to succeed. So we are a master's degree. Uh, it's a master of animation and visualization, which is why we call it the MAV, and it's an immersive one-year accelerated master's degree. Uh, so it's really about taking juniors uh, and generalists into specialists. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So why don't we start by showing you our showreel and some examples about what we've been doing here over the last few years. Um, it's always great to see how what students can do uh, when they work together over the course of the year. Um, I always find it inspiring. It's amazing. Uh, so as you can see, we are an immersive uh, studio-like experience. What we do here is what, that we show students what it's like to be in a in a studio, be, be at a sort of a, at one of the large companies, how it works, and learn by doing. Uh, they are taught by industry professionals. Here are a few movies that um, our leads have worked on over the years. So we maintain a strong contact with industry as well. We're, we always have industry guest speakers come in and we maintain that contact as well to make sure that we're always up to date with, with what industry needs. Now, a quick breakdown about how our year goes. Uh, we are broken up into three trimesters over the year. Uh, we call them studios, very simply. Uh, studio one is pre-production or the connected studio where we develop the story of the project. We work on the pre-production, design, early modeling, assets, previews, and early animation. Uh, then studio two or the collaboration studio, we like to also call it the emerging technology studio. That changes every year according to whatever the emerging tech is, and we create some form of narrative-based project using emerging tech. 
And then Studio 3, which we're in at the moment, is the Challenge Studio, basically production. Um, so this is the one, uh, Alison, we're in Studio 3 at the moment. Um, yeah. How, how busy are you at the moment? Pretty busy. <laughs> Very yeah. busy. Um, and also learning a new, I'm in lighting now, going from art to lighting. It's been, you know, a, a huge learning curve, but we're getting there. Everyone's pulling through. All the leads have been really great and helpful and, you know, showing us what we need to do and you know, covering that knowledge gap. So it's been good. It's been a challenge, but good. Good, good. good. So you're not you're not too stressed out then. Glad to uh, glad I might to be in denial, it. but um, it's I'm having fun. <laughs> I like I like the challenge of it. So yeah. Brilliant. It is the closest um, simulation to what it's like to be in, in industry, the Studio 3 part. Uh, it's it's fantastic, but it is it is tough work, but we do spend most of the year or the rest of the year building up to this point. It's very exciting. Uh, some studios where our graduates have found work afterwards. Um, not only that, these are also the studios we maintain contact with over the course of the year. We all, always like to talk to studios, not just here in Sydney, but around Australia and overseas. And we've had some really fun uh, awards over the years as well. We've been ranked number one in Australia for 3D production excellence by the Rookies. Uh, every year, uh, short film has been shown in festivals, uh, not just in Sydney again, but around the world. And the one that I'm very proud of, which is just amazing, is that we have a 90% uh, graduate employment rate of our grads because the industry knows now we have a reputation and our graduates are sought after once they finish the course here. So it's it's just such an amazing thing, uh, great achievement for, for all of them. Okay, we are a collaborative, large-scale project-based learning college. So what does that mean? What that means is that uh, you learn what it's like to work together. When you get everyone working together on one project, magic happens. It's not just you taking aside something and working on your own, you collaborate and work with others. And so by doing that, we need people to specialize and do one thing really well. And this is really what tonight's talk is going to be about. Our cohort and, and industry is made up majority of these 11 departments. And these are the departments that we need potential students to, to apply for and tell us which one you're interest, interested in. So we'll be going through each one of these, what they do, and also what you need to do to apply for it, for the department. Um, and so hopefully you can, you know, find your place and your specialty throughout this process. Um, so they are art department, previous layout, modeling, surfacing, rigging, animation, effects, lighting, compositing, technical direction or TDs and production. So each one of these departments in industry does have little offshoots and different areas of specialty, but we'll be kind of going over the basics of what they do and what you need to show to uh, provide to, to uh, apply for them. So what to put in your portfolio or showreel? And uh, just as a sign up, we are looking to fit, fill all these roles for 2024. Uh, applications are open at the moment. Uh, so please do apply if you're interested uh, because it's, you know, we can always give you feedback on your reels and your application process as well if needed. Okay, let's start with art department. Uh, this is how Alison joined us. Alison joined us in the art department, applied through this process. Uh, Art Department does quite a lot of things actually in here and in industry. It's everything from designing the characters, storyboards, assets, props, um, color keys, color scripts, titles, posters. Alison, what else? Am I missing anything? I think you've covered a lot of it. <laughs> Surfacing. There's so much. Prints, you know. Environment. Uh, Plants. Every little detail has to be designed. So, yeah, I think you yeah. covered it. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything that you see on screen has to be designed in art department to be given to the modeling department to model or reference for the lighting part department to kind of reference. So it always stems from the, the art department. And there are many different areas in art department to specialize in. So what we're looking for, um, just a note on this in general across tonight. Uh, if you go on our website and you look at the kind of work we've done, what you're seeing is the work of the students and the graduates at the end of the year. Okay, um, please know that your, so what you're seeing is, is their work after working in these single areas for a, in a year, uh, which means their skill set has improved and they've got better over the course of that year. So at the beginning of the year, what we're really looking for across, again, all these departments is potential, potential and passion, people who know what they want to do and are very passionate about it and can show, you know, at least some potential in these areas that we're asking for. 
So in art department, what we like to see, and again, you don't have to show all of these. These are just examples of what it's good, what, what are good to show. So traditional art. If you've done a fine arts degree, that's great. We have had applicants come from fine arts background before in the past because those fundamental principles of form, color, contrast, two and three point perspective, everything uh, transferable uh, into digital. So it's always great to see people who've done painting and sculpture and other traditional art formats. Then outside of that, it's great to see characters. We all know you like to draw characters. We like to see them. Environments, it's good to see environments as well. Props and vehicles, any life drawing you might have done and storyboarding as well. So the idea here, at the very least, is to see variety. Uh, what we, you know, while it's great to see someone that can draw dragons really well, if it's only dragons, then that might help you on the dragon movie, but it might not help you if you have to work on another project with other elements and assets there. So please make sure you show us all the sort of variety and different kinds of work that you can do. So Alison, this is, uh, yep, we've got, this is your portfolio and this is what you applied with, isn't it? Yes, this is the work I've applied with. This Brilliant. is mostly, sorry. No, go yeah. on, go on, tell us about it. No, I was just going to say, this is mostly work that I did from like Enmore. So I made sure to cover the things that I was really interested in. So environments, uh, creatures, and there's a robot there. I even put work that I struggled with. So I just wanted to make sure, yeah, that I covered a range of things. Um, Which is... yeah, my Oh, go on. So please. No, I was just that. That's it. So yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> and look, it's fantastic, and Alison, and this is really why you know we we wanted to speak to you straight away because you did show variety. You showed us, like you said, the robots and these other sketch areas as well. Then you showed us this environment, and I love the black and white studies that you did here as well on these on these on this kind of beautiful forest um, asset, and then the character as well. So you've kind of covered three of the areas straight yes. off the bat, straight away, which is. Wonderful. Um, and I always love seeing work in progress stuff as well, which is great to see the thought process. So I think that this was, part of feedback you this was a final project, was it? This was part of a final project when I was at Enmore. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I was also able to get teachers reviews and a review from um, Chris French before submitting officially right. for my application. And, you know, the thumbnails was like part of the keys of like the work in progress of how I got there. So I Fantastic. made sure to add a lot of that in. Brilliant. Oh, well done. Well done. And then um, Alison has been working in art department throughout Studio 1 and 2 and then transitioned into, transferred over into lighting department. And just a quick note about that, because uh, in case there's any confusion, we do say that people only do one department throughout the entire year, but there is room for people in the art department to move into either lighting or surfacing at the end of the year, while certain assets kind of, while art department runs out of assets to create. And um, it's great because uh, people coming from art department already have a good eye for light and color and learning the tools of lighting um, kind of can translate quite well. So uh, that's what Alison has done this year. We'll talk about lighting later on as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, next one is previs and layout. I've got a little example of this. So previs and layout. Previs is uh, the uh, early 3D blocking stages of the film. This is how we kind of create the animatic and get a 3D animatic of the story just to make sure that things are working well and, and how are, you know what assets do we need to make, how big do the sets need to be in the environment. And it's a very fast moving uh, department. Things have to move quite quickly in previews because it's all about testing. It's all about getting an idea on screen as quickly as possible and seeing if it, if it will work. And then layout is a second part of previews where a layout is really just the uh, cinematography. Uh, that happens after, after, during, and after animation. And in that case, it's only about working the camera, the digital camera of the film. So what we're looking for, for people who are interested in previews and layout, and this will suit people who are storytellers, who enjoy directing and enjoy cinematography or photography as well. They're, they're just a really great kind of area for a little bit more of a generalist skill set as well. So it is in Maya. That is the industry standard, just as a heads up. And you have to be able to, you should be quite proficient in Maya uh, to be in this department because it does move quickly. So basic animation skills, basic modeling skills. And um, it's always good to so just seeing those two is great. And then if you want to push it further for your application, copy a storyboard into 3D or copy a scene from your favorite movie into 3D as well. Now, I'd recommend not doing anything longer than about 10 seconds 
20 seconds maybe because that's a lot of work, but really just seeing can you copy a camera move from something and translate it into a 3D environment, which is always kind of like a, a good test. Now here's a, uh, what I'll show you now is this is a showreel of uh, one of us, our student now who is our only layout artist throughout the, the whole year. So he has quite a lot of work on his shoulders. So what he demonstrated was that he showed that he could model, which is great and do a bit of surfacing. So there's basic modeling skills here, basic surfacing skills. Then he did a little bit of work here in VR, in Unity and animation as well. So great, he's done some animation. And then at the end, a little bit more animation as well. So great. So we saw straight away that this student could do a bit of everything and could cover, had some technical ability. And so there's all these things were perfect to be able to move into sort of previs and layout from that point. Modeling is next. I'm sure you all know what modeling is, but you know, we'll go over it anyway. Uh, modeling is creating the assets that we use in the film. Modeling is just the grayscale asset. There's nothing else beyond that point. Modeling is all about topology. Um, so we do have students who like modeling certain things. Some, some of them like characters. Some of them, I mean, every, a lot of people like characters. But there's also all the props, the environment, the organic things, hard surface modeling. So hard surface modeling is modeling kind of chairs, robots, cars. Then organic modeling is modeling rocks, trees, forests, and that kind of stuff. And then obviously you have characters as well. So for people who are interested in modeling, here's what we would like to see. Please pay attention to the top line. Always show the topology. Uh, can't stress that enough. That's all we want to see. That's, uh, by the way, if you go into industry, that's pretty much all your uh, or the industry is going to want to see as well, is just the gray shaded uh, model showing the topology of your asset. So, um, you know, because we want to see, you know, are you thinking about the flow of, of your edges, your edge loops? Are you thinking about kind of conserving your topology in certain areas and keeping it dense in other areas where it's needed? Are you thinking about animation? You know, does an arm or a hand kind of have the right flow lines to be able to deform well for animation? So that's why that's really all we want to see. You can include it surfaced as well, if you'd like, uh, but really, Grayscale images are more than enough to apply. Like art department, it's great to see some variety. So show us a hard surface model, show us an organic model. Uh, if you like ZBrush, sure, show us a, uh, a, you know, a sculpt you've done, but just know at the end in production, we do need that sculpt to go through Maya again. So you need to be able to translate that or retop that in Maya eventually. Um, term tables are good for showing topology if you'd like to do it that way as well. An environment model is always good, buildings, forests, that kind of thing too. And then any or assets, props, swords, chairs, anything else you might have done or created for, for a project like that. But really, it's always coming back to that top point. Um, and look, modeling is, is a, there's a huge need for modeling as well. It's, it's you know, everything comes through that department. So, um, and we will need a lot of modelers for next year as well. Here are some examples of uh, JIRAs. These, these were JIRAs uh, models that he applied for. This is a student from this year. He sent us here, he did two characters, this character and this one. And again, JIRA showing us the surface asset here on the left, and then the grayscale topology throughout the rest of the as well from all sides. So just perfect, very clean, very clear, exactly what we need to see. And then great, some something a little bit more organic, the shoe. And then a couple of hard surface objects as well, the phone and the uh, and the house too. So perfect for us to see straight away that, okay, this person understands topology, under, understands how to kind of create an asset like this, and it's all in quads as well, so it will smooth well. Um, so, you know, ticked a lot of boxes straight away. Next one is rigging. Uh, if anyone has any interest in rigging, can you please, please apply? Uh, we have been famously short on riggers here over the last couple of years. So, And there is a desperate need for riggers in industry as well. So it is a very, very viable career option. And we would love to have you in studio too. Um, so rigging is really creating two things. It's creating the uh, skeleton inside uh, the character or the asset, and then creating the control system. This element, you can see the box next to her face, 
and that's the uh, the control system are what the animators use to control the asset or the character. So it's not just um, characters. We also need to rig the props, the vehicles, everything else that we do. And it's a nice blend of creativity and also uh, technical skills as well. So what to include? Anything you've rigged, really. Um, you know, look, a body rig, a face rig, show us a control system that you've made, um, a hand or a foot or leg, like really a good, a good leg rig just with getting foot roll and twist and, you know, a good look at and having just a leg, a leg rig with a foot that works perfectly is, is amazing. That's, that's more than enough. No need to create a complete muscle system and a face rig and everything like that as well. Love it if you did, uh, but please don't feel that pressure to do that. Um, something simple that is clean and works well uh, is often more important. So let me show you a rig of, uh, sorry, a reel of our rigger from a couple of years ago. Now, I'm just going to jump here. So what Robbie has done is Robbie has just gone through uh, this rig that he's created and recorded himself, himself just uh, moving different assets and parts of the rig uh, to show the different controls that he created and then afterwards has shown what it looked like in shot. And again here, just showing parts of the face and the rig and what it can do just sped up. And that's pretty much it. I mean, look, this is a very, very lovely rig as well, but anything that you might have done or rig, we'd just love to see how you've done it and how it's controlled. Surfacing is next. So surfacing is taking the gray shaded models from the modeling department and painting them up. Uh, it is a great department for anyone who likes uh, who basically likes uh, is an artist, a 2D artist, but also likes 3D, but might not kind of like enjoy modeling. Surfacing is um, really bringing life to the 2D assets. And there's a lot of storytelling that happens in surfacing as well. Um, we call it environmental storytelling. It's a way of saying this asset or this thing that we're seeing here is has been used, it's been loved, you know, it was left out for a while. There are photos maybe of a family on the wall or there's, you know, a scuff there. Someone spilled a coffee on the front, you know. There are all these different ways of telling the audience a whole story in life has happened to this thing, right? And that can go take something that's just a simple asset and transform it into something that can really elevate the story. Uh, we're doing our surfacing in Mari at the moment, but to apply, don't get too hung up on the software, okay? We really just want to see your skill set because we can teach you the software. It's more about showing us what you can do. So again, good to show a good variety of objects and styles, hard surface and organic, realistic and stylized. That's always great to see. And a mix of characters, environments, and props. So... Always good to see a turntable. Um, and as well with the format of lighting that shows off the quality of the shaders, um, better to do that than something that's too dark where we can't see things or too high contrast. It's nice if we can see your surfacing to the best uh, the best you want it to be. Uh, so here's some examples. Uh, this is Jake's uh, train that he surfaced. He's another student from this year in the surfacing department. Uh, what we loved about this was the variety of different textures and styles. There's some rust there. There's, you know, he's hugging the rust to the edges. There's, you know, dirt and everything. There's scratches on there, and it looks like a, a train that's been used. And this next one is beautiful, clean, still life. Um, and again, just showing that he can do two different kind of, two different styles and, and subject matters. So everything here is a lot cleaner, a lot simpler. And in the train, it's a lot sort of like gritty and uh, gritty and dusty and dirty. Yeah, great to see. Great to see both of these and different kind of textures as well, going for a pattern texture and a flat texture and, you know, and something shiny versus something matte as well is, um, is always good to see. Animation. Uh, animation is the next stage. Uh, that's my, my background. I started the animation department and, and, always have a love of animation across my career as well. Animation is, is uh, bringing life to the characters. Uh, so it's really just taking the, uh, the, the rig that the rigging department have done and performing. So the animators are the um, unrequited, unrequ 
<laughs> uh, the sort of like I guess shy shy actors of um of the production role um because they are kind of giving performance they're working with the animation director like an actor working with a director um but yeah it's a it's a lot of fun so what do we want to see from animators who would like to apply uh should look ideally in my that should be ideally i understand if you've um have only animated in other software but we will be animating in my here which is an industry standard and so if you can't animate in my you might fall behind so we do want you to be able to at least and have the basic skill set in Maya. Then beyond that, really just a few simple kind of performance, a few simple pieces is all that's needed. And again, it doesn't have to be rendered. It doesn't have to be lit. It doesn't even have to be in an environment. Uh, showing a biped walk cycle and a quadruped walk cycle is great. A simple bouncing ball test. Um, that shows more than enough of the basic principles of animation. Uh, just by doing a perfect bouncing ball test is fantastic. So don't ever sort of like undermine or under you know under undersell that that test because it's a great indicator of of getting through those principles. And then if you have time or if you've got something, always seeing a performance piece uh, is great as well. Um, it can just be a three to four second uh, piece of dialogue from a film or something else you enjoy, just animated to camera. Generally, as a mid shot, that's all you need. Uh, just to show uh, any kind of, you know, performance or acting kind of ability that you have with characters. And there's a lot of good free characters out there online now that you can use to do all these tests. Here's an example of an animator from, let's turn off the music, uh, animator from a couple of years ago, Marina. Uh, this was her reel that she applied with. Uh, and it was great to see, you know, she did a creature piece, uh, which was good, uh, you know, a run and jump, again, something physical, and then after this, and a performance piece. All right, fantastic, you know, brilliant. I mean, that's kind of really it. That's all we needed to see at that point, and it was enough to say, okay, well, this, this person is obviously passionate about animation and uh, has the basic understanding of the skills and the core principles of animation. And then we can go from there. Over the course of the year, we'll obviously enhance and go over more like we will with every department, but there's enough here to warrant getting them in to, to go over these principles because you know what's shown there is enough to display that. Next, the effects department. Uh, just checking I'm going for time. Good, we're getting through well. Uh, the effects department. Effects is making things explode, <laughs> spark and and water and simulation. And there's there's a lot now. That is what we traditionally call effects. Uh, is all of whoop, is all of this stuff. All of the all of the sparks and all of the smoke and water and and it's what's called simulation uh, in industry. Also, we do effects. Uh, there is a difference between effects and VFX, just so you know. Uh, VFX is usually taking these elements and applying them to a live action plate, uh, like you'd see in sort of like Marvel movies, Avengers, and so on. And that's usually trying to make it look as realistic as possible, whereas effects is the action of creating this, these elements in a 3D environment. Um, now, next year, we are looking at trying to incorporate some VFX into the, into the process. We haven't really kind of worked out how that's going to look like yet, but if you are interested in effects, please do apply. Now, something else I'd like to mention is that Houdini is, well, Houdini is the pipeline now, basically industry standard across the world. Um, and Houdini has become so spread across all these departments that it has actually bled into other areas. Houdini isn't just simply simulation anymore. You can now light in Houdini, you can surface in Houdini, you can create environments in Houdini. There's a whole lot that can be done there now. And so the industry is really, really, really wants juniors who have an understanding and ability of, in this area with this software. So we understand that there aren't really many undergraduates out there, courses out there that teach this software because it is quite specific. So outside of every other department that that uh, that join us here at the Academy, we teach Houdini. We will, we will take people through the basics of Houdini in Studio One. 
and go through the fundamentals and teach you the software so that you're ready to get into kind of like the bulk of working in this software over the course of Studio 2 and Studio 3. Um, so if you have any interest in this area, please do apply because know that we will train you in this software. Next year, we would love to have at least five people uh, in the effects department um, because there is you know, a lot with that can be done in this area that isn't just making things explode. There's there's so much more that can be developed using this software. And if you have, you know, creativity on one end of the scale and, and technology at the other end of the scale, Houdini's right in the middle. It is the perfect match of both of those together. And it really, I mean, there's just so much you can do with this software. So um, please do apply if you're interested. I'd love to have you join us. So this is from our um, Ross, uh, sorry, from RAF, our uh, uh, effects lead this year, what to include in your portfolio if you're interested. Now, he's, he's uh, sort of like gone under the assumption that you have done some work in Houdini. And please know that there is a lot of free tutorials online uh, that you can do and go through these kind of that process yourself. Uh, so we understand what level you need to be in order to get in. But if you have done any work, what he's saying, what he would like to see is, again, a variety of effects, maybe a procedural modeling or animation, a part particle sim, a rigid body sim, or fluid sims, pyro or liquid, and then character effects as well, because that's a whole other area of, of effects, which is character effects, doing muscles, doing hair, doing fur, stuff like that. Now, they can be fully rendered shots or play blast. So again, you don't need to render this out perfectly. Just a play blast is fine. And if you're replicating a tutorial online on YouTube, see if you can make it your own. See if you can change something in it so it's not exactly the same as everything that, that has been done using that tutorial. Use the knowledge creatively and demonstrate that you can kind of change a bit or adapt it to suit yourself. Um, and Houdini is ALA's preferred software in the effects discipline, not just here, but I think everywhere else. And if you do have reference, like you're showing a um, something explode or if you're showing kind of like a crash or some a destruction shot, if you do have the reference, please put it in there as well uh, to show us where you got the reference from. Now, here is a reel from another student, uh, effects student from a couple of years ago. It's quite fun. So Nathan kind of did a sim on the, uh, on the cloth. <laughs> did this, this shot, but there's a lot here. The the water splatting on the ground, the things breaking over there as well. Um, all these elements of particle system coming out, the, the deformation on the uh, on the um cushion. Uh it was really fun. And uh, and all these bits kind of falling out as well. I mean, look, they're just a bunch of really fun little tests uh that can be done, you know, which Houdini is perfect for. And he just kind of obviously showed us that he was very passionate about this and to be doing a lot of this on the side as well. Okay. Lighting department. Alison, we're back to you. Yay. <laughs> do you want to um do you want to tell us a little bit about what lighting is? What's what's your sort of day-to-day? -day? How does it work? Yeah, so lighting is towards the end of a production. So we take all the assets, uh, all the like so the models, the surfacing. And we just bring it to life. It adds a lot of like emotion to it. So every day we start off about all our goals, what we're doing today, what shots are we aiming to finish or get close to finishing. And then towards the end of the day, well, now it's the beginning of the day. A few hours later, we aim to show something for review and then keep working on that until we get the get the feeling that we're trying to get across for that shot. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been really really exciting actually I didn't think I would I knew I would like it but I didn't think I would enjoy being in a new program learning a new program and then applying some of the skills from art into this and yeah. what soft, what software are you, uh, are you using katana using katana. so you're you're lining into katana and you're rendering in render man right oh yes in render man yes okay and you had no background at all in either of those, <laughs> either of those not software. any of those programs no 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 so I how, came in. How have you found that? How have you found that that transition move to learning them both? It was a bit intimidating, to be honest. But yeah. uh, we were given some time, you know, some leniency to to learn it. There are past examples um, and videos here at ALA about how the pipeline here works, which was very very helpful. I I'm still referring back to them and still learning from them. 
Um, but yeah, uh, Ross, who's the, the soup, the lead, sorry, for lighting has been a great help these last few weeks. He's really, you know, taken the time to show us, you know, what we're doing basically and how we, sh how we should be doing it. Um, but yeah, Fantastic. I've also found, um, sorry, <laughs> I've also no, no, found. Keep going, please, yeah. We are kind of a little bit responsible to see like glitches and things that have gone wrong or yeah. modeling error, uh, errors, surfacing errors. Um, it can be a bit frustrating having to kick that back, but um, I do like to to tell people what they've done wrong. So that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great bonus, isn't it? Fantastic. It is. And, uh, brilliant. And um, so have you found it all, just going back the other way, have you found being in lighting department has helped with your artwork? Yeah, it goes, it's like a circle. So, you know, I'll take a shot. I'll get my notes back from um, from Ross, who's the lead. Uh, and sometimes I'll just put into Critter to just quickly figure out what I'm aiming for based on his notes and then apply that into Katana in the 3D space. So, yeah, it's a circle. It just kind of goes around. Good, That's good. Cool. Look, it's it's so exciting. It's so exciting um, for lighting is just really because it's the first time we really see everything come together. Yeah. You know, you've got all of these departments Very working exciting. on their own. You've got the modeling department over there and surfacing over there and animation kind of everyone's sort of like yeah. all over the place. And then when lighting builds the shot, it comes together for the first time. And it's just, it's really exciting to see everything kind of, you know, in one place. It's, um yeah, yeah. I love it. It's fun. Um, all right. So what do you include if you're interested in lighting? I'm just going to mention one thing uh, at the beginning of this is don't get too hung up on software. Uh, again, because uh, we understand that Katana and Render Man aren't usually taught in undergrads. So just if you can show these, these skills or, or your interest in lighting, it can be in, in anything. It can be in Maya, it can be in Unreal or Unity or any kind of software. It's more about showing the principles than about understanding the technology. So show a variety of lighting scenarios, for example, a daytime, nighttime, and natural practical characters and environments. Uh, what's good about that is that there's a lot of free environments online, like a, you can you can find asset, assets like a sort of an office room or a garden or a house or something that you can use as an example to light. And then lighting it in different times of day, at different times of day, uh, is, is a really good exercise. Um, so they can be presented in a full CG shot, or you can do it like we're talking about with VFX, you can shot showing sh CG elegy elements sorry, uh, that you've lit and integrated into a live action plate. Um, it doesn't have to be moving, mind you, it can be a still image, um, but really showing how that you understand how light moves in the natural world and can be translated into CG. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's a really fun thing to do as well. Um, yes, it can be from real time or pre-rendered software. And if you have, look, and again, you don't have to, but if you have used nose-based lighting software like Katana or Houdini, Solaris, that's fantastic, uh, but again, not necessary. We will teach you the skill set um, like uh, like Allison has done as well. Allison has, um, you know, came come across from our department and learned all of this in the last kind of few weeks, really. Almost. Like, Allison, how long have you been in lighting for? Since the beginning of the studio, so what's that like? Eight weeks, nine weeks? Oh, eight weeks, yeah, eight weeks, yeah. Eight weeks, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So, so good. Um, okay, so here is an example of a lighting reel from Sam, um, and Sam just did a breakdown of uh, this combi that she did, and then kind of went through the elements and plates and said, "My After Effects, Premiere, and Arnold." So and just showed us kind of like the breakdown of how she did that. And then again, what was really nice to see in this was the, the idea that I guess the storytelling component where that she understood that the light was coming from the fire. So it wasn't just kind of generally lit, but it's bright here, then it's dark in the background and so on. So there's, there's you know, really nice kind of understanding of saying, okay, well, this person gets it and, and realizes that light can't come from just anywhere. It has to have an idea and a direction. And uh, she presented that really, really well. And that was kind of it. That was all. The rest of her reel is a little bit more about sort of like modeling um, and showing a few other things as well. It was a bit more some animation in there too, um, more animation. Uh, but when we spoke to Sam, she said she was actually really interested in, in lighting. So that was the department that she ended up going into. 
All right. Okay, after that is comp. So what is compositing? Um, some of you might have heard the phrase, we'll fix it in post. Uh, it's usually this department. So the output from lighting is a rendered image, an image frame. And then what we do is other departments also provide rendered frames that are then all fed into comp. comp. So what might happen here is the, um, the buildings and the light have come through lighting department, uh, but then the effects department will give us the, uh, the snow. See the snow in the foreground. The effects department also gave us the clouds in the background. So all these different layers are produced by different departments and then they're all given to the comp department to layer up together and to make sure that they fit well. Uh, not only that, not only are they making sure that they fit, but they make sure that they fit in terms of color and, and the form and the depth and everything. And there's if there are glitches or, or problems in the lighting pass, they can be tweaked and color graded a bit in comp as well. So comp is really like the very, the end of the road. Comp is the last department where things kind of get added added to or changed uh, in comp. Um, but it's it's like, it's if you imagine sort of like layers in Photoshop or anyone who's done Photoshop, it's similar, but it is node-based. It's not kind of very much layer-based. It's more of a node-based node, node -based software. Uh, we use Nuke here at the Academy uh, for comp. And uh, that is the industry standard. Although you can show us, um, you can show us if you if you're interested in comp, you can show us what you've done in After Effects because there are a whole lot of tools now in tutorials of transferring your After Effects comp skills uh, into Nuke as well. And we have had many comp students in the past come across from from that area too. So please don't be afraid if you don't know Nuke, uh, we can accommodate that as well, and we can help you kind of transfer your skills across. So what to include in your portfolio or showreel? Okay, so full CG composited shots is always great. And again, it doesn't have to be new. After Effects is fine. Any live action comp shots that you might have done. So if you have kind of taken a photo of you taking some video and the, you've layered over the top some CG elements or even some other live action plates, show us what you've done that. It's always good to see the breakdown, the before and after as well. Any matte painting setups you might have done. Um, digital map replacement, digital background replacement, sky replacement, things like that as well. And then again, any motion graphics and design that you might have done in After Effects as well, just to show that you have an understanding of layering elements together. Um, so I think we've got a reel here. Yeah, so this is a reel from a student who's in uh, this year's comp department, Matthew. Uh, and Matthew showed us, so he's done, at the beginning he showed us what he's done. And he's, he's Matthew does a lot in Blender. Um, and he went through and did a bit of a breakdown as well to show us what elements he's done. So he, he's pieced all of these together and comped them all together and shown us the, the live action background. So what he's done in the live action, here's the sort of the display elements, the, the sorry, the live action plates. And then what he's done to kind of comp this together. And then he also included some modeling assets as well, but really, this, these elements at the beginning and this output was really what we wanted to see. And when we spoke to Matthew, he said, look, he's passionate about comp, but he did show the other, other elements as well, just to show that he is a little bit more rounded in other areas. But, um, uh, you know, this was the area that he was passionate about. And, and again, that's what we love to hear and love to see is that people who are passionate about one thing, um, because that goes a long way. People can be taught the technology, uh, but having that passion and having that good attitude is, is, is you know, harder to come by. All right, after comp, TD, technical direction. Um, yes, we need these people keep everything going outside of, outside of production. We need TDs in almost every department, if possible. Uh, if you know anyone who has done a um, comp sci degree or, and think that they have to go into IT, please let them know that they can work on animated feature films because the industry needs TDs a lot at the moment. All the tools that we use are created by TDs. Uh, it's not just kind of doing the background things, but it's also helping people what we call on the floor. So as people are working, as animators are working, we might need a tool to help them work on parenting, dynamic parenting assets together. Or even today, we worked on a tool that helped a wheel on our main character roll according to the speed that the character was moving forwards and backwards. There's so much interaction with TDs and the rest of the other departments 
it's a lot of fun. Uh, and there's a lot, lot that needs to be done and can be done in this area. And there's there's just, you know, so many different kind of ways to specialise in different directions if you're a TD in the film and animation industry. Um, so what to include in your portfolio if you're interested in this area? Um, obviously, it's good to know that you've had a background in, in this that you can program, um, but please provide documented experience in coding or programming. Uh, for it, it can be for digital production visualization, but really um, be great just to see what you've done um, on GitHub or any other coding projects that you've done as well. So for an example, Erin um, has given us a project breakdown of three of her projects that she's created. Uh, she told us about what they are, what she's worked on them and what the features are across these projects and then links as well into where we can see them and find them uh, on GitHub too. It's a really, really great area for anyone who is very who is a programmer and technically, technically minded and uh, didn't realize that this is a viable option for them. Uh, so if you have friends in this area, please do tell them. Uh, would love to get, would not a love, we really need more TDs uh, in this space. And then production. What is production? Uh, production is the grease that uh, that gets things moving. If TDs are the glue that keeps it all together, production is the grease that kind of makes sure everyone can get their job done. Uh, production, again, has many, many different areas. Uh, obviously, it can level up to being a producer on a big project, but on the day-to-day -day form, um, there's just everything from Communicating with the artists, helping with schedules, helping with dailies, helping with notes. Uh, it's, it's about helping people really be the best they can be. So a producer isn't about telling people what to do. Uh, it is about helping people achieve what they need to achieve. It's a really, really fun department. Uh, it's great if you are a people person. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you enjoy talking, if you enjoy helping people, if you enjoy kind of you know, collaborating with others and, and, you know, if you have good energy and it's it's just really great to have people with positivity and good energy in these roles uh, because it does have a definite impact on the output of the digital artists. I've seen that time and time again over the course of my career, how a good producer can dramatically help uh, departments get through their work faster. So what to include in your portfolio? You're thinking, okay, well, I don't need a reel. What do what do you do? I'll tell you what, just on that, if you have come from, uh, if you have done an undergrad in any sort of animation or art area, I still, you know, we still want to see it. It's always great to see anything that you've done in the past. Don't feel that you have to hide it from us. We'd love to see what you've done. It does help because it also helps knowing what how much of an understanding you have of certain areas. Um it's great to see that, uh, like it says here, teamwork and collaboration is the most important um, and attitude to be a people person. But beyond that, you know, you can tell us a little bit about your experience, about working on jobs at university or team projects on at university, how you collaborated with other people, how you communicated with other people. Tell us about any other sort of side jobs you've done or, or other, other work that you've done at companies where you have worked with other people because it really is about that kind of collaboration pro process. And of course, having a, a passion for the industry and animation is a big plus as well, because you know you, it's great to have someone who is excited about creating this content and about helping people create it as well. Anything that you've done with um, team management is good or project management is also a plus. There's lots of software out there at the moment as well, everything from sort of uh, Trello and doing a breaking down to the basics in Excel. It's great to have experience in those areas. Um, so please do tell us or show us that as well. And really it's about, you know, an interest in helping others and helping other people achieve and be the best that they can be. Fantastic. So if you, uh, we did go through that pretty quickly. Uh, I did want to save a few minutes at the end in order to open to, I can see that there's a couple of questions here as well. And I will answer them in a second. Uh, but if you had want to go over this again, we do have a, a video on our website uh, on YouTube called How to Make a 3D Animated Short Film. And what we've done in that is that we took our short film from a couple of years ago called Apart, and we went through every stage of the process, every department that I just spoke about tonight, 
and have gone through how it got created and how they all came together to create the final output. So you can all you can find that online as well on uh, through either through our website or on our YouTube as well, and um, and get more information that way too. Brilliant. Uh, on our website as well, you can see our past student projects. Um, you can see the one we just released one a couple of months ago, which was from our Studio Two project called Coffee Break. Uh, Alison worked on that one. That was um, that was in in Blender, and we did a whole drawer over the top in grease pencil. Alison, did you do grease pencil elements? Yeah, I did a lot of grease pencil elements. We everyone in art department did a lot of the two D effects as a part yeah. of it. So. It was really fun. It was, it was really excited. fun. Yeah. That was, I, I, I really it. enjoyed it as well. Had you yeah, used did. Blender before? I had tried to use Blender before. Hated it. Um, but <laughs> focusing on Grease Pencil was like, I was committed. I was so excited to learn that. I think I learned every single detail that there possibly was. Uh, but yeah, it was good. It was really Fantastic. fun. Yeah. I hadn't used Grease Pencil before because uh, everything nowadays, uh, not just grease pencil, grease pencil, but that 2D effect over 3D, sort of, you know, Spider-Verse, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Nimona, they're all, it's all sort of going in that direction. And it was really fun to kind of experiment with a project using that technology. And that's really what Studio 2 is about. It's about experimenting with new things and seeing what happens. Uh, but you can see all of these and our past projects on our website. Uh, so please go there and check it out. Okay. Questions and answers. I can see that we've got a couple here, but if anyone has any other questions that you'd like to ask, please feel free to type them in. So Dale, what do you recommend will you do if you're a generalist and not too sure which department you'd like to specialize in? <laughs> it's a really good question, Dale, and we get that one a lot. Look, we do, look, there is, there is a, let me, let me just clarify something about the, about the term generalist. Um, there is a need for generalists in industry, but most generalists in industry have at least five to six years plus experience uh, because they did come from another department and have specialized in a department and then have started to branch out. So the generalists in the visual effects industry, like at ILM and so on, we cover a little bit of look dev, a little bit of modeling, a little bit of surfacing, generally came from one area and then started to branch out. Because if you think about getting a job, you need to be able to actually show that you can uh, deliver in a certain area. So if you've spent sort of like one year here and you've covered like a whole bunch of departments, then your skill set might be about here across three or four departments, whereas the student who has spent one year just working in one area, their skill set's going to be up here. So in terms of what you do specifically, um, you, do need to, you do need to choose one in order to join us. Uh, outside of us, you don't have to do that. You can keep working in other areas, of course. But for us, yes, we need you to specialize. How you do that, look, I recommend watching your favorite movie, playing your favorite game, uh, checking out any of your favorite sort of animated content online. Like that's that's the best thing to do is like go back to the basics of what you found inspiring and what you enjoyed the most uh, over the last kind of either when you were a kid or, or recently. And when you're watching it, have a think about what you would have liked to have done on that project, right? So think about you wake up in the morning, are you working on that project? What are you doing? Are, are you designing the characters or are you animating the characters? Are you painting the backgrounds or are you doing the effects, right? It's really, you have to kind of like place yourself in that project and think about out of them all, what's really the thing that I enjoy the most and I would have loved to have done the most. And uh, then come talk to us about it, but please know, what we're trying to find, it's not about telling us what you think you can do. We sometimes get students come to us and say, hey, I can model, I can animate, I can also do that. And it's like, okay, that's great, but what do you want to do, right? So that's really much more important. There's also uh, like a pre-application process you can do as well if you need help, hmm. right, Alex? Yeah. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely, you can. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for reminding me. Yeah, you can, I'm good. You can, uh, you can send through your portfolio and say that uh, this is what you've done and that you can tell us in the form that you're struggling to decide between these different departments and we can help you with that as well. Good one, Alison. Thank you. Nice. Um, okay. If my experience in rigging is only in Blender, is that all right for the application? Yes, look, I, look at it. It is because the, the principles will be the same. You'll be a foot, you'll be a little bit behind in terms of understanding the, the technology because we do uh, rig and use in uh, in Maya, 
and you know you would have to get up to speed in that very quickly. Uh, but there are some of the elements and some of the the technical components are transferable. Uh, so I wouldn't count that out completely. Um, I just want to see what sort of work you have done in Blender before. And so we could probably, you know, we could even talk about that and see what you've done and how much of those basic principles do you understand in Blender? And then we could talk about being able to uh, transfer that across. But yes, please, I, I think it's absolutely valid that you could come across without having that sort of Maya experience. Okay, is university required to get a job in studio or can you learn as you go? Uh, look, you can, it's not required, absolutely not. Um, and in st many studios here and around the world uh, do have training programs, but they will not train you from zero. You have to show an a level of aptitude at least of being able to complete a task to a set amount of time. Because, you know, at the end of the day, studios are a business. They're getting paid money to deliver content and they have to make sure that they can do that within a set amount of time. And so they don't really have time to train people up from zero. Um, okay, here we go. If uh, there is someone like myself who focuses on particle fluid simulations along with learning VEX in Houdini, how broad of a portfolio skill set is needed to apply for effects? I, I, honestly, that's enough um, because we do have people in our effects department who do focus in certain areas. Uh, for example, we have someone who's really interested in, in simulation. We have someone else who is interested more in sort of like environmental work. Uh, someone else who wants to do char effects. So don't feel the need that you have to show every aspect of what you can do in Houdini. Just showing us the ability in one area is enough. And then, you know, we can develop that over the year. But I think that's if you've already done some particle and fluid simulation and that's what you love doing, show off. Show us what you can do. We'd love to see it. Uh, okay, what level of coding or programming do you recommend for applying for the rigging department? Uh, that's a good question. I'm actually not a coder. I've done a bit of coding in Mel. So what I might get you to do specifically is if you could email through and we'll pass that on to our TD here and he can answer that for you directly. But I think having an, a, a background in coding uh, is good in terms of the actual ability of what level you need to know uh, in that software. I have to admit, I'm a little bit unsure. So please do email through um, and we can help you with that after after tonight. Okay, how are we going? Um, okay, what about the, the graduate certificate in animation visualization? Is that sim standard similar to the MAV? The grad cert is really just Studio One. That's all it is. It's just the pre-production pre component. It's doing the same part and process and project. You're on, you're in the same group as, as everyone else. You just finish at the end of Studio One and, and that's it. And you finish with a graduate certificate, but you do miss out on the emerging technology component and you miss out on, of course, on the production component in Studio Three. Are we going for time? Got time for a couple more. Let's run through them. Um, what's the best department for coming up with a storyline for the animation? <laughs> Good question. All right. So at the beginning of the year, we brainstormed the story together with everyone. So even if you're in the TD department, you're still getting involved with story because it is a great way of getting to know everyone and a great way of learning how to collaborate and communicate with others. If you are passionate about story, there are really kind of two areas that are the two best areas in industry that you can work in. One of them is storyboarding. Storyboarding has a huge amount of control uh, on the story because a director might have a scene that isn't working. And the idea of the scene is, you know, what we really need here is we really need a scene that's funny and heartfelt, but we need the character to go from here to here. And this is what happens. That's all I've got. Go for it. And the storyboard artist might say, okay, okay, let me come up with some ideas. So that's real, apart from writing the script, that's really the best department for telling the story. Then the next one outside of that is previs. Uh, previs does have room to elaborate and kind of develop some of the moments a little bit more beyond the storyboard because it is in the kind of a 3D space for the first time, but not quite as freeform as the storyboard department. Okay. Um, where are we? During my time at AIE, during our end of year film, a class changed into a production pipeline with students being leads in each department. Uh, how is the production pipeline set up similar throughout the course? Okay, so we run the same tools, pipeline, and process as you would find at Animalogic, Flying Bark, Animalogic, and so on, where 
We're running all our dailies and reviews on ShockGrid. We're a Linux pipeline. We're a USD-based pipeline, which means um, for anyone who knows, a USD-based pipeline is what fast becoming the industry standard. So if someone is working in modeling and they publish their asset, it gets pushed to the surfacing department. The surfacing department publishes, it gets pushed to the lighting department and so on. So everyone is connected. No one's working on their own file and their own scene in isolation. It's all a connected kind of component. All the tools, uh, sorry, all the uh, all the assets are being tracked in ShockGrid and notes are in ShockGrid as well, as you would find in industry. And we run dailies in the morning, we run rounds in the afternoon. Again, the whole process is the same as production in industry. And the last one here, more of a logistics question than a question about the application. Uh, I'm going to be overseas for most of the November. I plan to apply at the end of next week. Hopefully, will this affect me getting an interview and getting into the course? No, it will not. Uh, as long as you apply, we'll have you on file. We can work out a time that suits for the interview process when you get back. Don't worry about it at all. Um, and one more here, I, mean, I do want to answer this one because this is a great question. Uh, is pursuing this program viable for someone in late 30s looking for looking to career change, pursue a dream in animation? Like is career change suitable like that? Absolutely. Please do. We have many, many students, 30, 40 and above, who are either changing departments or changing careers. We've had people come from architecture, from fashion design, from costume design, who have come from fine arts, who, who have been kind of traditional storyboard artists. Uh, it is a very, very viable thing to do and something that, you know, personally, I love to encourage as well. So, so I do apply. Brilliant. Thank you for all your questions. <laughs> I got through them pretty fast. Okay. Um, application process. There is more information available on our website. Please do go and check it out. Uh, just so you all know, the application must apply. This is there, but just to make sure you understand a portfolio and a showreel, a personal statement of why you want to join the academy. I'm just going to add something to that. Don't just say why. Please tell us what you want to do so we understand what your specialty is. But again, showing passion is a huge thing as well. Your CV and then your academic record and documentation of any industry experience you might have had as well. There are scholarships available. You can find them on the UTS website. Uh, we do, there are scholarships that uh, are sponsored through different ways. Uh, all the information is on there online. If you have any questions about that though, please do feel free to email in and we can help you out with that. And then the application dates. The first round of applications uh, close at on October 31. Um, there will be, a, if we've got room, there will be a second round of applications open after that date, but only if there is room in those departments, uh, because we can only accommodate a certain amount of people per department. Otherwise, uh, it gets hard to manage the production. So please do apply as soon as possible. Even if you don't feel like you're sort of up to that skill set yet, yet, please do apply so we can have that conversation and we've got you on file and we can start the process earlier than later. And one more thing, apply even if you're currently finishing or completing a course uh, because you can get accepted under a conditional offer as well. And there we go. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Alison, thank you so much. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was lots of fun. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. No, it was great. And look, again, if anyone has any other questions beyond this point, please, again, you can reach out to us and email us for more information, and we're happy to help. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Take care. Cheers.